Tom. Who? Be quiet. So those are the credits. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming to, for coming to this talk. We're, we're going to talk about what lies beneath. That's a vertical slice down through a working Java program. We're going to look at the Java source code, down to byte code, down to machine code, different kinds of machine code, right down to the, right down to the hardware. I'd like to introduce this talk, before we, before we go any further, by uh, giving you a comment that was made by a friend of ours, Nitsan Wakehart, who was a huge help in, uh, in, in uh, creating the, the, this version of this talk. So, uh, so, he, so when he saw it, he, uh, he said, right. That's what yeah. lies beneath. <laughs> lies lie beneath. Okay, so and just to introduce ourselves briefly. Well, this is Maurice Naftalin. Um, he uh, tends to combat his insecurities by writing books and becoming champions of sorts of yeah. leagues and stuff. Uh, so yeah, he's yeah. all that, but... Uh, this is and me, just me. And this is and, and I, I introduced Dimitri. So Dimitri is um, a software engineer, and he works for Ingenius. And he is, amongst other things, he's the disorganizer in chief of two uh, unconferences that you may have heard of. One of them, JCrete. Almost everybody's heard of JCrete, and Dimitri is the hero of JCrete. Um, an unconference is like a conference, only like JCrete differently. Uh, we organize ourselves. It's self-organizing, generally much smaller more intimate, the, uh, the, the, it concentrates on the things you like about conferences, which is the hallway conversations. JCrete is, is kind of in Crete, um, and JAlba, uh, which, is the, which I'm the local organiser for, is in Scotland, in Edinburgh. Well, the next one is in May this year, and um, it's going to be great. So, May 7th. <laughs> Take note. Sorry? May 7th. May 7th. May 7th, that's right. So uh, pre-register for this to increase your chances of getting on it because it's becoming popular. And there's a trip afterwards to the Highlands. Pre-registration, essential to get onto that. Right, so we're here to talk about what lies beneath. Well, another Hello World talk. We're going, to, we're going to take a tiny, tiny program, which is going to, um, which is, you, you'll see, does almost nothing at all, and we're going to trace the execution of that from top to bottom. And it turns out this is actually really amazingly complicated. There's a huge amount going on just in understanding this one simple little program, and it's also, re I think, really, really interesting. So we'll start off with what basically everybody knows. Uh, we think everybody knows this. Uh, you, you, you write your Java source code, you run it through Java C, and you get some bytecode out of it. So everyone knows that the Java virtual machine is based on bytecode. And to start off with, at least, we'll see that the, at the beginning, this bytecode is interpreted. And we'll see exactly what interpretation means. There's, and the, 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 the interpreter Two interpreters, in fact, are called the template interpreters, and we'll see why. But the basic idea is that the byte codes, which look like this, so we've got, uh, we've got byte code operations here, which uh, do integer division on, on this stack, which load a constant, we'll see what that does, which uh, loads a, 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 moves a, um, a reference, and so on. We'll see these in a bit more detail in this talk. And the template interpreter provides machine code for each one of these instructions. So the big arrow there is showing that the template interpreter goes around, and first of all, it, it executes, it, it produces the machine code that corresponds to IDIV, and then it produces the machine code that corresponds to LDC, and so on. And these things make the, the code that the Java program executes, at least in the first place. All right, and so, this is a, so that's a picture of what IDIV looks like. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail, the x86 machine code, in a moment. So here's our program, we're going to, we're, the tiny program that we're going to, that we're going to examine in, in a little bit of, in, in some detail. So, the, so what the, 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 the um, method that's going to be called at the end as, as a kind of climax of the program is going to do this really complicated thing. It's going to add 254 to the value it's supplied with. And we're going to call that from, uh, from a, a method called compute, which takes, which takes a value. And it, and it um, sets up a constant, which, is, uh, which we're calling divisor, because we're going to do a division. And we're going to use the hex 
uh, the, const- the, the uh, integer, the big negative integer, whose hex representation is dead beef. And then, then we're going to call, we're going to, we're going to do the division between the supplied value and the divisor, and then we're going to call add. And, and, and here's our main method, which is, going to, which is going to call compute with cafe babe. Hands Ca- up if you know what cafe babe means. Okay, we uh, okay. Like so we're getting, up, we're getting old. We're yeah. getting old. People don't recognize this, this byte string. Go on. But it's very sexist, you know? Fun? It's not 21st century. No, that's, yeah, why, yeah. that's why people don't want yeah. to admit that they know the what Cafe Babe is. The Code of Conduct says we shouldn't mention Cafe Babe. So the story is about Cafe Babe is that when, uh, the, when Gosling was d- initially designing Java, what, they, were, they were in a tiny office somewhere in, uh, in, in downtown Menlo Park, I think. And uh, they used to go for their breaks to a coffee bar. And, uh, and, and he fancied the cute baristas there. That was the phraseology. So cafe babe is the, uh, is the hex string that, that is embedded in, in the cl- every class file, in, the, in, in, in every Java program that, since the beginning of time. But we can't talk about that. So, so, so dead beef is the uh, is a politically acceptable alternative. So here's what the program does. It takes cafe babe, it supplies it to compute, uh, it, it, then, it then divides that by dead beef, and, and then it adds one to, and then it, uh, the result of that is the result of that computation is going to be one because there are two big negative numbers. Where the cafe babe is bigger than dead beef, and uh, then it's going to add 254 to that. And w- the reason we've chosen that is because it illuminates, it illustrates some interesting things. So that's the that's the Java code. Um, we're going to see what it looks like when we translate it to bytecode. Um, we can we can look at that bytecode using Java P with the verbose flag set on. So here's so here's what you see a bit edited when you when you run Java P. The, this is a, a a standard program that comes with the JDK, and we see there's three parts to it. One part is the constant pool, which um, which is 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 for the for the whole program. And the constant pool is, as you might imagine, the way where constants are stored. So so in this case, for example, the integer literal dead beef is represented in the constant pool, and there's method references and uh, and so on. So things that are not going to change during the during the execution of the program. Uh, there's also for each method there's uh, there's code. That's in the, the, for the compute method. This is showing it for the compute method. And there's, there's the byte codes. And there's also, there's also a, local, a local variable table, which is initially going to be, which is initially empty. So if we, um, and, and, and I think, though D- Dmitry and I were arguing about this earlier, I think that if you want to understand what the local variable table is, just imagine what a stack frame is like on a, a, in, in, the, in a call stack in a conventional program. Okay. All right. Is this over to you? Over to you. Give it to me. Give it to me. OK, so um, we have all the parts, class file. Let's see what happens when we try to execute. So when we execute a method, um, we create a call frame. And the call frame <coughs> contains two bits of information. One is called local variable array. That's where your local variables live. And the actual operands tag, because JVM is a tag-based machine, so it does all computations top of stack. So, if so we start, do you know? Do you know why they made the JVM as, as a, a stack machine? I think back in the day it was just bloody expensive to to do the register thing, and they, it was easier. Right. So, easier. so it's not a great fit now, is it? Really? I mean, how many people actually have stack hardware stack architectures? Probably I th- nobody. I, I think the answer is. I think the answer Zero. is nobody. So there's always a lot of messing about in real life between the between uh, values that are on the stack. The, the, the JVM call stack, uh, the JVM operand stack, and, what, and where they have to be in order to get any real work done with them on a real machine, which is, of course, in registers, a lot of register allocation messing to be done. Yeah, but all the VMs are now stack based, so let's see stack based architectures win for actual VM implementation. So let's see what, uh, what, what happens when you try to execute. So if we try, uh, try to walk what happens at the beginning, so we are trying to invoke our compute method. At the beginning, we have um, an empty frame without anything on it, so we need to start execution. At the beginning, we populate local variable array. And as you see, at the slot 0, we have this pointer, because we're invoking an instance method. And in order to invoke anything on an instance of a class, you need this. So it comes to a local variable array. What comes afterwards is all the arguments to the method, which in this case, we have a single int. It's a cafe babe, so we get that onto the stack, uh, not on the stack, sorry, in local variable array. So this is just like a pre-setup before we can actually execute the bytecode. So at this point, we haven't executed a single bytecode yet. So if we go on, 
uh, it's time to invoke the, the bytecode. So interpreter will take the bytecode stream like and execute bytecodes top to bottom. In this case, we are, we are doing the first one is LDC, which stands for load constant, which as the name suggests, loads a constant from a constant pool onto a stack. So we see LDC2 points to an offset 2 in the constant pool, and this case is a dead beef, and dead beef lands in our operand stack. Then we do the iStore. iStore is funny because it actually stores, it loads stuff in from the stack and stores in the local variable, so the dead beef then goes into the offset 2 into a local variable array. What's that i at the beginning of the iStore? Well, i stands for integer. So ah. it's funny, there's a, there's a bytecodes that are special, like I and uh, L and F oh, and right. D and so on. So presumably, a, so presumably A load zero stands for A would be? A ray? No. <laughs> a <laughs> means reference. A means reference, right? right? It makes yeah, sense. That's totally. obvious. So A is reference. So that's what we're doing. Then we're loading something. So, so A load is actually taking something from local variable and put it on the stack. So it's kind of a store, but it's actually called load because we load from the local variable and put it on the stack. So we load this. Then we need to do the same with cafe babe and dead beef. And with that, we are prepared to do the actual division. So by this time, we're just shuffling things around. We haven't done any computation yet, but by this time, as you see uh, at the top of the slide, we are ready to do value div divided by divisor, and that's what IDIF is going to do. So IDIF takes two values, divides them, and puts the result on top of the stack. So we have one as the result. And then finally, we are ready to do the invocation. So in Java, there are several invocation modes. One of them is invoke special. Invoke special is, stands for invoking constructors or private methods. Then normal one is invoke virtual for invoke, invoking public methods and protected and stuff. And then there is invoke interface and invoke dynamic. And then also invoke static when you invoke a static method. But in this particular case, it's a private method on our, on our class. It's called add. And we invoke in that. Again, you see there is a reference three. And reference three means it's a pointer to a constant pool and it's a method reference, and it's computer.add. So we're going to do this. And in this case, because it's a second method call, we need to create a call frame. So we basically create a stack frame. And that also has a local variable array and operand stack. So while we call in, so this is like a Java stack. You know, your invocation thing is growing. Sorry. What? <coughs> So you call another method and you know call call stack becomes deeper and deeper, you you invoke in stuff. So here we're just gonna do add, and we set up local variable array as, as well, and then we do the 254 plus one, 255, we get result back, the stack frame is destroyed, and we are ready to actually return from our method. This is the last bytecode, I return, and with that, we're done. So basically this is this was easy, right? We just walk bytecodes one by one, do something, not rocket science. No rocket science at all. Shall we dig deeper? No. Okay, right. So, um, <laughs> what, what, each one of those, each one of those bytecodes got to be executed. What happens? How do we get here? Uh, oh, so well, I know how we got here. We're going to look at one of them. We don't have time to look at. We, we, all, we just about have time to look at one of them. One we're, the one we're going to look at is IDIV. What, what does that do? Well, here's the machine code for IDIV, the x86 machine code. You can get this by uh, just using the flag dash xx print interpreter when you, uh, when you run, when you run the, the, your Java program, and you get a lot of output. Right? So, this, so it, takes a while, it takes a while to work your way through this. Dimitri and I looked at this for quite a while, and we scratched our heads, and we tried to work out what's going on. If you're not really expert at x86 machine code, there's quite a lot to understand here. And we eventually we figured out that some of it's pretty straightforward. So up here, this is all that messing about that I was talking about, where we're, where we're taking the dividend and the divisor, and we're putting them into registers for the, for the x86 architecture. So this so, is stack unwinding. We're just taking something from a stack and put into a register. Yeah, so we don't need to pay any attention to that because it's just setup code. And, and there's something at the end here as well which, is, which just arranges things so that for the template interpreter so that it can jump back to execute the next bytecode instruction. And the stuff in the middle there, that's IDIV. Right? Well, that's a bit weird, isn't it? Because if you look at the bottom of that, 
There's an IDIV instruction. There's an IDIV instruction. Divide, right. 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 So IDIV, IDIV is actually built into the x86. I mean, it's an x86 instruction. What, so what on earth is, is all this messing about before that doing? Can anybody figure out what's happening there? What would be a special case of dividing that needs a special treatment? OK, and division by zero would be good. Is there a zero here? There is no zero. Zero raises, a heart, raises an interrupt. So Ooh, actually, zero is what OK. Else? It's, it's a good guess, but it's not zero. So it's a boundary value. What kind of boundary value in Java creates a problem? There's maxint. Somebody else wants to take another end? <laughs> Minint, yes. You know Java math.apps. The mean name doesn't have a complementary positive number. So it's one, one bigger than the max positive int. Therefore, if you divide a min integer by, by what? When it couldn't be a problem? By minus one. That's the problem. Then you need to create that's the, that's something that doesn't exist. So, so, if, so, so this if, code handles so this. So if you look at this code, you can see that what's happening at the beginning there is it's comparing, um, it's comparing the uh, divisor by minus one. And, then it's, then, and, and if that's the case, then it's jumping essentially to the end. And otherwise, uh, the, the next line just clears the, just clears the EDX. Just show the diagram. Uh, I will do. Um, and and then, then it's doing a comparison with, with minus one for the, uh, for the divisor. And then it's... And, and only if, only if it passes those two conditions. So it's not d dividing by minute, minute by minus one. Only then does it actually go ahead and do the di division. So we do a flowchart for that. It's the first flowchart I've done in a long, long time. It brought back happy memories, I can tell you. Yeah. So w here's an interesting thing. This is happening every single time the JVM interprets a, a division an integer division instruction. What a huge overhead for, for a really special case. I mean, how often are you actually really going to try and do that? Well, the answer is very, very, very rarely. But you're going to have to, uh, you're going to, have to execute the machine code instructions that look out for that special case every single time you do an integer division. So the same kind of thing is going to happen for pretty much, pretty much everything. OK, so that's, that's a, a look at um, the... the um, uh, at interpreted code. Let's, let's go back to our program and have a bit of a think about this. So this, pro this program is um, it's written according to modern standards because the methods are really small, and that's, that's what we're supposed to do. In various ways, that actually works, out, works pretty well for, uh, for Java programs, even in terms of efficiency. But looking at this, you might think, well, there's, a, there's kind of a problem there because there's a significant overhead to method calls. So, it, it, so as it stands, if it executes that code directly, we're, we're making a call to compute, and then we're making another call to, to add. And it's pretty clear that the add method could actually be inlined. I mean, we could actually just, uh, could just move, move things around a little bit and, and, in, and inline the add method. But wait, that's what you had to do in COBOL times. Pun? In the, yeah, absolutely. You did, you did it by hand in the old times. Now, Dimitri like, really likes to measure things. So Dimitri decided he was going to write a benchmark of to, see whether, to see whether we'd really improved things by eliminating this I always have goal. to prove him wrong. So. Right. And of course, I know better than everybody else. I'm going to write benchmark by hand, right? This is what you do in 21st century. You write stuff by hand. And you know, I'm pretty confident that this stuff does what it's supposed to do, right? It just uses system nano time that can never go back. It's monotonic clock. That's what you use to measure duration. I do that, and then I divide it by number of iterations, and the number of iterations is huge, so JIT compile and everything can kick in and do crazy stuff with it, right? This is correct. Who is with me that this is correct? I think it's great. Ah, I have three hands. Good. <laughs> Thanks. You have my fans here. OK, so then we run it, and we get a result. That's, that's pretty good performance. That's uh, one 250th of a it's, nanosecond it's, per operation. Yes, well, um, this On might a be a bit of a problem. So this machine is roughly 3 gigahertz, which means um, a single clock cycle is 0 0.3 nanoseconds, and this is 100 times faster than a single clock cycle. So either Java is like faster than speed of light, like big deal, or there is something, something else going on here. And actually, JIT just deleted the code. It's that code eliminated crap. It just didn't do the, even, even half of the loop. It just went through it and then destroyed it. And what I measured was basically how good JIT is in, 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 in eliminating the code. So, 
So, so what, Morris knows the answer how to do it better. Of course I know the answer. What, what, this, what this is showing is actually, I mean, we, we, we put this in here. I'm sure like, not very many hands went up to say that, that was a great benchmark. And you're quite right, because writing, your, writing benchmarks by hand is a really bad idea. And the main reason, the main reason it is, is, as we're going to see, the JIT compiler's got a lot of optimizations, and it's going to attempt. In this case, it's really easy to optimize that code. In fact, because, the, because you can see the result just by, by doing constant folding, just by, you know, just by looking at it, you can see what the result is. Well, the JIT compiler doesn't, can see that as well, and it doesn't, have to do any, it doesn't actually have to do any calculations. Uh, it, does it, or it calculates it once. So, uh, so, the, so you need, what you need is something that's actually going to frustrate the optimizations that the JIT compiler can put in and make sure the code that is executed is actually the code that you've written. And a benchmarking harness written by people who actually really know their stuff, is, is, is the way to do that. So JMH, the Java Micro Benchmarking Harness, is now part of the JDK. It's written by people who really did know, who really did know their stuff. And, his, and although we don't want to explain all the annotations here which, which actually control the code that's generated and, uh, and explain, explain how it works, nonetheless, you've got a lot more confidence. It's not complete confidence by any means that if you, that if you set that up right and then you make your... The make, the method that you're um, benchmarking, uh, you, an you, you decorate that with the app benchmark annotation, you've got, a, you've got a fighting chance of actually seeing what the performance is of that real code when it's really executed. And just a um, short note here, it also contains some bad flaws, but it's written the way it's written for, because we want to make a... Um, um, for a purpose of the presentation. So if you actually go to JMH documentation, you will see that you should never put constants in the, in the method calls. They say it's, 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 a, it's a wrong way to do it, but we do it because we want to prove the JIT's uh, capability of optimizing things. But actually, don't take it as an example of good benchmark. Not even this. Not even this. Okay, so let's see what happens now that we've got a benchmark that, 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 so, that so actually sort of works. Let's see what improvement we managed to make by inlining that, the, the, that add method. So here's, here's the result of, uh, of running the, the, um, uh, the, the manually optimized code compared to, compared to running the, uh, well, we called it improved in there, compared to, compared to running it with, the, uh, with the, the full method call. And you can see that there's a significant improvement when, with simply manually inlining things. Except if we're running it in interpreter. Right. So the results here only show interpreter. Minus x int disables JIT compiler, so it runs. So it's basically like slow Java. Minus x int, let the Java be slow. But this is because we're talking about interpreter, and we see, yes, if you do manual optimization, you can get improvement. Okay. Although I would say this is not needed. Right. So where do we go from here? Well, um, we go to interpreter and bytecode, and uh, well, there is something missing, right? I'm talking about JIT compiler, so there might be something missing, and that is an actual JIT compiler. So while the code is running, VM collects statistics, like invocation counts and some other stuff, and this statistic can be used by JIT compiler to, to optimize code. Um, open, open JDK uh, hotspot has two compilers, C1 and C2. One stands for client compiler, another one server. First one optimizes code, uh, not so much, but produces um, uh, machine code fast. Second one does, does lots of optimizations, but takes longer to optimize. And since JDK 8, the actual comp we have a, like a mix of both compilers called tiered compilation, where the code might start and optimize first in C1 tier and then move to C2 if it's uh, used frequently. So we don't go into that much detail. We just want to show what, can, what it can actually do to the code and um, to prove that, for instance, if you have small methods in Java, you don't have to inline them manually. JVM can do a way better job than, uh, than you can. And actually will do it to the code which makes sense and not to the code that is not there. Um, but before that, uh, let's look uh, if we run the code with JIT, but with one crucial optimization disabled, this is inlining. So I want to have JIT optimize code, but I want to forbid him from inlining stuff, because inlining is the mother of all optimizations. Once you bring more code together, um, JIT can see more and can do more stuff. So I am explicitly forbidden here to inline, but just say keep all the method calls, but still run through a JIT. <coughs> So here we have the, the benchmark method. It simply calls our compute. Nothing special. This is our compute method. 
which does stuff. Uh, hands up if you see a division on the screen. We are, do you remember, we are dividing Cafe Babe by dead beef, but there is no division. So interpreter did a good job. It invoked the CPU instruction to divide. JIT is cheating here. Instead of dividing, it's multiplying. So why on earth, why would you want to go to all this trouble ah. to, remove the I, to remove the division instruction because from the machine code? Because division is one of the most expensive CPU instructions that these days, or actually the most uh, CPU really instruction, if we don't compare to um, cache misses and other stuff. So division is expensive. So compilers do stuff and tricks, especially if you divide by constants, to move away from the division. So for instance, if you divide by two or by power of two, you can shift left and right. Uh, and uh, the same you see here. It's, it's replaced division with multiplication. And it produces correct results. So let's hope JIT is not cheating too much, but actually giving you right, uh, the right answer. So OK, so first thing we see, it replaced the expensive instruction with something else. And then final method simply adds an 254 to the result of uh, to, to the ADX register, which contains our, uh, our one in this case, and it's 255. And here you see what inlining does. So and previously, when we forbid uh, JIT to inline, it had to execute each and every method. So the scope of the optimization was within the boundary of a method. Now, when, when, when we say, you know, inline everything, JIT managed to inline all the entire stack, uh, call stack and see that we are doing Cafe Bay by dead beef 1 plus 254, 255, and actually deleted all the code. So the reason we put a constant into the benchmark was to be able to see this. So, so, you're telling, you're, so you're telling me that all of that code that you had in the, in the last few slides is replaced by this one instruction? Yes. So ev actually, it's never doing the call anymore. So after JIT compilation, what you see is essentially a return statement, return 255 in the benchmark code. That explains the result maybe of your, uh, and br of your brilliant benchmark. And that explains code. the result of my brilliantly broken benchmark. Because the whole loop was replaced with basically write 255 to the result and the printout statement. It had to execute a couple iterations, let's say 10,000, and then the JIT kick in, and maybe by iteration 50,000 something, it actually throw away the loop and, uh, and stop doing the nonsense. So it's quite powerful. And if we look at the results, this is what you see. So if we run an interpreter, we are like 180 nanoseconds. With disabled inlining, we're at six, let's say. So it's, you know, factor 30. And then we can get another two speed up by essentially not doing anything and returning constant. This is a silly benchmark because it said the end returns constant, but the whole point was to show not the expensiveness of computation, but what the JIT can do. And it's not the only thing that JIT does. JIT, JIT, JIT is very clever and very powerful. There's lots of interesting optimizations, like it eliminates your null checks, it does. Uh, put your locals into the registers, it does dead code elimination, as we saw in my previous benchmark, it does loop unrolling, loop vectorization, and, 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 and. So lots of stuff that makes Java really, really fast. And that's, by the way, my broken benchmark shows this uh, one thing when sometimes people compare C++ and Java, and they say, Java is one million times faster because I get my answer in 0 0.04 nanoseconds, <laughs> and the poor C++ has to go and do the loop. It's just because JIT is cheating a lot. <clears throat> Yeah. So it's quite nice that we have uh, such tools at our disposal. These, 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 um, uh, these optimizations here, and most, most of them are standard compiler optimizations that, been, that compiler writers have known about or, are de or have been developing for, for, for decades. So really, we're, we're getting the same kind of technology now brought into, the, into a dynamic runtime. The great advantage of running with a dynamic runtime is that, is that these optimizations can be applied in a context where the uh, virtual machine knows a lot about its hardware environment. So it knows what kind of, uh, how many processors it's running on, whether it, whether it's got um, uh, NUMA, uh, you know, special, especially fast memory for some processors. It knows, it knows about, uh, it, it, well, it knows, a lot, it knows a lot about the environment. And that means that it can adapt, uh, that it can adapt dynamically to wherever it's running. And, and, and that means, of course, that Java programs are generally going to be a lot faster because you don't have to retune them. You don't have to retune the JIT anyway for each new, for each new platform it's going to run on. So what platforms is it going to run on? We've, we've got some code. We've got, we've got down to seeing how, how the the um, machine code that we can we can have, but what what now? Well, we wanted to go all the way down. So what now is that the, is that the program is going to execute, and uh, and when you come to look at the um, when you come to look at the 
uh, a, a, the, a modern machine uh, hardware architecture, you kind of very, very difficult to convey just how complicated it is. We found, we found quite a nice little, um, uh, nice little slide that I think, sh I, I think kind of gives, gives my picture of what it's like inside a, inside a modern machine. There's a lot going on. There really is a lot. And, it, and it's kind of, it, I'm, I'm upset about it because I, I learned about computers at a time when you really could understand them pretty easily. They used to be really simple. So what happened was you had an input device and it brought, uh, you, you got some da uh, data and instructions into the central processor. Well, they, uh, the, sorry, the, um, the, it, the, it would trigger the data would, go, would uh, come in through the input device, be sent to memory, and then the, the, um, the execution of a program was essentially a dialogue between the central processor and memory. And it was pretty straightforward. You loaded instructions from, from memory, you loaded data from memory, the instructions acted on the memory, you got a result and you sent it to the output device. It was a bit complicated because there was, there was also slow devices there, but that was, just, that was just a wrinkle. It used to be so simple, and I, I kind of went to sleep on this for a few decades, and I woke up and I discovered that they really aren't, aren't anything like so simple anymore. The, what happened? Well, what happened was that processors got better. That was really... The, the, the hardware architects should not have done that. It's complicated life a lot. And the, they, they are really a lot better. One of, the things that, one of the ways in which they improved was they got wider. What do I mean by that? Well, I, meant, I mean instruction-level parallelism. So here's a picture of instruction-level parallelism. It, what it turns out is that a single instruction, or a single... Rather, a single processor can be uh, it's essentially split up into a number of different processing units. Um, there's the, 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 each, one of the, each one of the initials here stands for a different stage in the processing. The uh, instruction fetching, instruction decoding, execution, uh, memory access, and so on. And, and, and these uh, different stages of executing an instruction can be executed in parallel. So a single processor can, do, can be doing a lot of things at once. That makes life a lot more complicated, but it makes makes each processor very, very much faster. So, that, so instruction-level parallelism is one of the ways in which, they, in, in which processors have got to be a lot faster. Here's another way in which they, in which they have. They, just the clock cycle time has just been reduced a lot. So, so now processors can execute instructions so fast, it's really, really hard to keep them supplied with, with, enough, with enough instructions and, in particular, enough data. So the, the hardware architects have come up with various, with various ideas, including kind of free uh, weird things like, for example, speculative execution. So speculative execution means that, that what you're going to do is that uh, the, you're going to load up and, and actually maybe execute code on the basis of... Uh, decisions that haven't yet been taken. So you might. So if, if you're if you're executing a loop and the and the uh, the loop test, you've a million times previously always gone one way because you've executed that loop a million times. Then you might reasonably guess that the million and first time you're going to do the same thing. And so you might start loading up data ready for that next uh, ready for that next execution, uh, in the hope that you, in the hope that you're going to need it. And then you might be wrong. And if you're wrong, because this is the, this is the one time that you exit the loop, then you're going to have to throw away the results of that. So speculative execution is one, one way of getting around the, the problem of the speed of the processor. Another way is caching. So well, I'm, we wanted to pick on one particular aspect of the hardware. So, so caching, caching is a good example of how this affects a Java programmer. So caching is a, is a big deal here. Why do we need it? We need it because the processors are so much faster than memory. But memory's got a lot faster over the years, but it's not got nearly as, mu as much faster as processors have. And if you look at a modern chip, this is what, this is what it looks like. That's, this one's actually not that modern anymore. So you can see that there's a big area of cache at the bottom. This is shared cache between the different processors. But each one of those cores has also got a lot of cache. And some modern processors, you can have up to three quarters of the real estate is given over to caching. And the reason for that, and the reason for all that caching, is because it needs to, you need to maintain uh, the, a memory hierarchy. And a memory hierarchy looks like this, where, the, where the, the memory that is nearest to the core is fastest. And so the core can actually uh, can, can work really quickly. It's not as fast as registers, but it's getting on as fast as that. And, because, and, and the trade-off is that the, the, the level one cache, which is what we're really interested in here, because the, because the processor can access it so quickly, turns out to be a lot faster 
uh, not only a lot faster, but also a lot more expensive and a lot more power hungry. And so, there's a, so the memory hierarchy is, 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 is shaped like this. Capacity increases as you go down there as the, uh, as the access time increases as well. So typically, as you go from one level to another of the, of the caches, for example, they're about, each one is about four times slower than the previous one, which means that, which means that the access, accessing level one cache typically takes about, I don't know, um, four... Two, uh, two, two or three nanoseconds, something like that. Uh, whereas, uh, whereas the access to main memory takes around about uh, th- about 500. That ca- that kind of number. So, a, so, so a cache miss is really, really expensive. A cache miss meaning that you've got to fetch everything from main memory. It doesn't sound like very long, does it? Three or four hundred nanoseconds. But but it really affects performance a huge amount. So, so in other words, what so dominates worse. performance right now is cache misses. Yeah, so don't, kill spoil, don't spoil my next slide. I like this slide a lot. This is a, Mon- this is a, a stamp from a Mongolia in the, ni- in the 1980s. It shows how they put out fires. The, the, we're trying to do the opposite. We're trying to keep the cores hot. So, so I, like, I like this idea because actually it shows that, that, it shows that the, the, the da- it's like the data that, is, that, has to reach the, uh, that has to reach the fire. It's like the, it's like the uh, water in the bucket chain. And if there's a cash miss, everything, all the water in, the, in, in, in that bucket chain is, uh, is no use anymore. It has to be dropped because, you, because you've jumped off to some different part of memory. You're going to have to load the caches up again. And the water has to come all the way from the river instead of, being, instead of coming from the nearest bucket to the fire. Right. Leave my slide alone, right? I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, very, fond, I'm very fond of that Mongolian stamp. <laughs> I have nothing against Mongolia. <laughs> right, right. So we, so, we, so we thought it would be really interesting to actually look at, so, um, to, do, to run, some, uh, run a test on some cache friendliness. Oh, you've put this slide in, Dimitri, about the, that actually shows these things. So the idea, the idea of, this, of, of, this, of this benchmark is that we're, we're simply going to iterate over a linked list, and we're going to iterate over a, a primitive array, and we're, going to, and we're going to compare them. The reason for choosing, for choosing these two different things is because a primitive array maintains data locality Really, really well, and a linked list can't main, can hardly maintain it at all. I'm kind of oh right, you've taken out the slides with my nice diagrams. Exactly. Okay, so I'll just have to wave my arms and try and explain this. So, so the um, so the the data locality is really important because if you have a regular pattern of access of, uh, uh, through memory, the hardware can predict where you're going to need your next your next uh, data item from. If you're stepping along an array, for example, stepping along a primitive an array of primitive integers. Ints, then what? Then the hardware can say, "Oh, right, I see. I see what you needed last time, and you're stepping along this in a regular way, and so I can uh, so I can predict where it's going to be next, and I can preload the the uh, the data into uh, into the level up that up that cache pipeline." But a, but a, but a, um, in object-oriented programs, and the linked list is like a particularly bad example of that. The, your data accesses are jumping about everywhere in memory, and the hardware, and you frustrate the prefetch mechanism of the of the of the hardware, and the result of that is really really dramatic. So, so no, yeah, the one point I want to make. So in other words, when, what CPUs are doing, they are looking for patterns. One is the pattern of access. So if your regular pattern access. CPU can spot that and, and, and see this. So when we are walking the array, there's a regular pattern. It can spot this. A jump in a linked list, the pattern is not there. It also makes two other bets. One is temporal bet. When it loads memory, and um, if you use memory recently, you're probably going to use it again. So you need that. And there is also spatial um, uh, bet. When you load a chunk of memory, there is a big chance that you're going to need the next one. Therefore, prefetcher, when we're working with the previous cache lines, the previous chunk of memory can already get you the next one and the next one and the next one. So for instance, if you have a uh, primitive array and it's huge, it doesn't fit into any cache, but you work in a, in a, in a predictable stride, um, the CPU will keep prefetching by avoiding basically um, before it would hit the actual uh, cache miss, it would al- already give you all the data. With linked list, we have two levels of indirection. One is linked list itself, so the, the nodes, the pointers between the nodes, but also the integer. We don't have linked list of int in Java, not yet, maybe after Valhalla is there. But that means that instead of int and four bytes, we have an integer object in yet another level of indirection. So there's two jumps to make. And that is basically the disaster of, in the making of, and the same, the whole Java code, the object oriented A.B.C is actually an invitation for a cache miss. And that's where the performance just 
falls down the drain, as we're going to see now. So, so, we, so we've got... Um uh, we run, ran benchmarks, the, the benchmark you saw on the previous slide, and we ran that on linked list and, uh, and, and, uh, and, onto, um, and, on prim- and on a primitive array. And we did it on data structures of uh, between one and f- four, four, different da- four different sizes, between one and 512k, and, and we looked to see what happened. And as you can see, the performance on the linked list really deteriorates as, time, as, as the list gets bigger. Hugely. And you might think, well, the, all we're doing is just iterate it, it's just, just stepping, uh, stepping along it. So the kind of classic uh, order n, you know, big O complexity theory that you learned at college says it should be constant because you've got the same number of operations, no matter, um, uh, you, you've got the same number of uh, operations per, um, per stepping down the list, no, ma- no matter how, b- how long the list is. So where does this huge deterioration in, in performance come from? It's certainly uh, it's, it's echoed in, in another measure, the number of instructions you man- can manage to execute per, cl- per clock tick. And th- this one uh, measures, it's a standard measurement, it's the other way around, number of clock ticks per instruction. Normally you'd expect to get a, a, a quite a low number there because, you, because of that uh, instruction level parallelism I showed you earlier. You'd expect to get, have a, quite a lot of instructions being executed for the same clock tick. Well, it really deteriorates here. Why is that? Well, the number of events per operation, cycles, is, cycles goes up in the same kind of way, doesn't show anything. But the number of instructions per operation is exactly the same. So it's not a CPU problem as such. And you'd expect that because it's the same operation for a long time. So we're doing the same amount of work. So the the amount of work done per iteration doesn't depend on the the size, which makes sense. Absolutely. So so, and where does it come from? Well, the answer is shown in this line. This is the this is the key one. As the as the list gets as the list gets longer, the caches get filled up, and they have to keep on being refreshed. We're jumping around in the memory, uh, exactly as Dimitri said. The the, uh, the the hardware can't detect a pattern in in the in in the way that memory is being accessed, and so we're getting a lot of cache misses. And you're thinking, wait a minute, like how many? You know, that, this is. Not that many cache misses still. It's two, what is it, two cache misses per operation? Well, it's not gone up a huge amount. But remember that each cache miss costs an enormous amount compared to instruction execution. So, so each one of those cache misses amounts to hundreds, of, uh, uh, clock uh, hundreds of, of clock cycles and therefore hundreds of uh, operation executions. And then the rest, the rest of it shows, shows, pretty, shows pretty similar things. Even at the end, we're even starting the last, last level cache is the one that's nearest to memory and even that is starting to build up. So, so, so that's what's wrong with linked list. That's the, the, the bad news for linked list. If we do the same thing with a primitive array of ints, we don't have any of those problems at all. Well, that's an extreme case because we can't always program with primitives. And I certainly wouldn't recommend that you always yes, program with, um, uh, with, with arrays rather than collections. That seems like a really big limitation. But if you look at this, you can see that what happens is that the, the performance stays exactly the same along the top. And the reason is that only at the very end, when, with the biggest one, are you starting to get any, any level one cache misses. And, the, and, and there's, no, there's no cache misses on the, on the last level cache thought. at all. And the difference in performance is just extreme. It's just extreme. So this is one example of the sort of problems that we get, basically from writing um, object-oriented programs, I'm afraid. Object orientation implies objects that are going to be distributed in memory, and that's always going to frustrate modern, modern hardware architectures. Maybe you might think we've been a bit unfair because like, nobody really likes linked list very much. Who uses that? We all use array list. Poor, unloved linked list. We feel for it. But, um, but, but actually, array, array list d- turns out it's not a huge amount better. Because if, because if, the, if, a, if it's an array list of, uh, as it must be, obviously, of objects, then, then, then you've still got a, a, a data-dependent load. And you're jumping around in memory to access the things that the, that the, that the uh, elements of the array list are pointing at. So it gives a slightly better performance than linked list. Linked list is a bit extreme, and as I say, as, as uh, Josh says, nobody, nobody loves it. But it's still really a problem. I mean, we, we, and, and we're going to have a problem. Are we going to have, we're going to have a problem for all time with this, aren't we, Dimitri? Well, probably not. We have Valhalla coming at some point, and uh, we'll have value classes, or inline types, that they're called. And maybe we're going to have our data locality and stuff 
in Java 127, maybe. <laughs> well, actually, no, as a joke goes, it's Valhalla. So you're not supposed to ever get it, because Valhalla <laughs> is the final destination. <laughs> so if you're going to get Valhalla, probably, well, we'll be beyond. Yeah, so, in li so inline types are, are a kind of big destination for, uh, for, for Valhalla. And the idea of those is they're going to organize memory. You're going to be able to write some kinds of objects and they'll be broken down into primitives, and, and, the, and you'll, get the, you'll get the data locality that you get with, with, that you get with primitives without having to fall back to using, to using arrays. And so you get, you get the advantage, the idea is it codes like a class, behaves like a, a primitive. So that's, that's going to be the, that's, that's the idea behind it. OK, so we've, uh, we've managed to, to get to our conclusions. The conclusion is uh, there's a lot to learn about, about the execution of a Java program. There's a lot of advanced technology going on here. And, um, and as everyone knows, to, uh, it's, a kind of, it's a cliche to say, any sufficiently, advanced is, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And it's kind of unfortunate if we as professionals professional technologists start believing in magic and as a kind of if, if you take for granted what the what the java how the java uh, technology works you, you, and you don't think about it then 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 you will find yourself believing in magic and that's not great for your understanding of what's going on and for your ability to cope with really unexpected effects so don't believe in magic the stuff that we've talked about here can all be found out with there's a, we've got a, a slide of references coming up we've got a slide of references here the, uh, we found out about all of this by using open source tools. And, and ones that are really very easily obtainable and very easy, very easy to, to, to discover and to use. So anyone can, anyone can get the understanding that we're trying to, we're trying to put over here. And we're, we would really recommend this as being something that you should do for your, uh, for your, professional, uh, under, for your professional understanding and for your ability as a, as a programmer. Do you want to add anything, Dimitri? No. Any questions? Oh, huh, it's all gone quiet. Okay, well, thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thanks for coming. <laughs>